We're here at Coin Summit with Susan Athey from Stanford Graduate School of Business. So let's talk about uh, the economics of Bitcoin a little bit. So I, from a lot of economists, I've heard complaints about the deflationary model. And then other people say that you know, if it's used for payments, it's not really much of an issue. Yeah, I think that the, em the emphasis on the deflationary aspect is, is sort of overstated for a lot of the purposes. Um, basically, if I'm trying to move money through the Bitcoin system, I sort of care about the level, I don't care about the level of the exchange rate at all, mm -hmm. and I only care about the volatility for about 10 minutes. Right. So I'll move money in, I can change dollars to Bitcoins, I can move those Bitcoins across the blockchain, and then I can change those Bitcoins back out. So for the purposes of payments and moving funds, uh, it's, it's, it's not really that important what the exchange rate is. No, for sure, and if you use some third parties, it's not even an issue at all. Imagine if you buy it Coinbase and you say, send it to BitPay, BitPay gives you a 15 minute window, you buy instantly. Coinbase and you send it and there's no real currency risk at all. Exactly. And I think that for some consumer uses, it's actually a really important advantage to abstract from all of that stuff. Right. No, for sure. Do you think this is going to play a big part in remittance? Where do you see this going in the future? Well, I think remittance is a really nice application. Um, it's, you know, there's the, some of the world's poorest and most vulnerable people working really long hours and paying very high fees to get money home. And I think, you know, on a regular basis, that's an issue. But especially if someone has an emergency, mm -hmm. you know, somebody, oops, you know, they ran out of money, they, they spent it, they lost it, something went wrong, and they can't buy food for their family tomorrow, they can't pay their rent, they can't pay their school fees. So those types of emergencies are when people really can pay very high fees because they're moving a smaller amount home, they need to get it there fast, and they're basically at the mercy of the system. So I think that a couple of things I can see happening there. Um, first of all, remittance companies can use it as a more efficient back end. And so some of the smaller entrants are you know, operating at very, very low margins. And so if you're trying to enter to be able to be, to maybe account for some of the cost disadvantages you have as a new entrant, having a more efficient payment rail um, can, can really help you. Another thing that's I think kind of interesting is that it could actually affect the cost structure of remittances because if people are not needing to hold as much cash, um, they can operate more efficiently and you can have a smaller set of people out there um, you know, working as remittance agents. So I think most people are pretty sold on, on Bitcoin as, a, as an advance in technology when it comes to payments. I mean, it's, it's pretty clear you can move a lot of money much more efficiently with Bitcoin. But as far as a store of value, people, there's a lot more debate. Do you think it's possible to kind of separate the store of value from the payments aspects of Bitcoin? Well, so one question that I often get asked is sort of why did these creative people, if they, they, it's great they invented a security protocol, but why did they have to invent a coin? Right. You know, why did they need to invent a new currency? What's wrong with the dollar? And so they're kind of missing a fundamental point about the way the technology works. If you had an entry on the ledger that said, you know, I have a dollar, that's only a message, it's a promise. Right. Um, and, and, it's, and if I move that, that IOU to someone else, it's a movement of a promise. Right. Um, and somebody, you, the money actually still has to move. We haven't invented a technology to beam a dollar bill onto your keyboard, unfortunately. So, uh, it, you know, as we wait for that technology, the thing that you can beam is a Bitcoin. And the reason you can beam a Bitcoin is the definition of a Bitcoin is an entry on a ledger. So if you use the security protocol to move it, you have, that is the definition of the change in ownership. There's nothing else involved. Right. And so that's what's really magical about it. Now, once you have something like that, of course, it's an asset. Um, and so it's a, potentially a store of value. Um, it's an investment if you think it's going to go up. Uh, it might also go down. So, uh, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily think of framing it as just a store of value by itself is really that meaningful. It's just like any other asset that, you know, you might think it would grow if people are using the system more and the system's very popular, it's providing a lot of utility, the price of the Bitcoin will go up, but if people shifted to some other system, the price would go down. So it's, I don't think of it as so much a store of value any better than a stock. So do you agree with Warren Buffett? I'm going to have to call out. You're, you're an industry expert, you know, world-renowned economist, and we've got the oracle of Omaha saying that Bitcoin is, you know, eh, not so great. Any, any thoughts on his uh, recent quotes? Sure. So I think that um, a lot of people come to this from the perspective of, you know, um, is this sort of some magical new thing? Um, and it's not magic. It's a technology. Um, but I, I think that the technology has a wide range of uses. So I think that the technology is going to have a lasting impact. Now, if you're, if you're up close and seeing what's happening in the community, 
that would give you a lot of reasons to think that it's going to grow right. in the in the short to medium term. And if it grows in utilization and popularity, the Bitcoin price will rise. The Bitcoin price will rise in proportion to the transaction volume, basically. So, um, you know, you could say that you shouldn't invest in Bitcoin. You could also say that you shouldn't do angel investing, that venture capital firms shouldn't invest in the Internet or venture capital firms shouldn't invest in healthcare. You know, I, it seems it seems a little funny to me to just sort of write off the whole thing. I think of there is a couple of sectors of innovation. Financial innovation is clearly one that we that has a lot of room to improve. Our technologies are pretty terrible. It's been one of the reasons it's taken so long is that it's hard. It's hard to compete with the credit cards. It's hard to get into a regulated sector. So that's why it's been slow. But the fact that it, those impediments have been there also means there's a lot of room for improvement. So if I say, you know, would I take a bet on a sector, financial services innovation using technology seems like a good bet to make. And right now, if you think that that's going to grow, probably that's going to move, you know, along with Bitcoin. Um, do I think that this might get replaced by something else? Could Bitcoin be zero in five years? Um, absolutely. Just like if you, you know, it's possible that, you know, Airbnb gets replaced, it's possible that Uber gets replaced, it's possible that Uber gets regulated out of business. Right now, these are really fantastic companies. They, they create value. Uber and Airbnb create value by matching people. If there was nobody listing their rooms on Airbnb, well, Airbnb wouldn't have any value. If there was no cars on Uber, Uber would have no value. If nobody is using um, Bitcoin for transactions, then Bitcoin can have no value, right? So that can happen with any of these things. But if you see them growing and attracting people onto their platform and providing utility to those people, you might think they're more likely to grow than fail. But failure is always possible. For sure, for sure. I, I agree. I think we'll see, we may see Ripple or Dogecoin or something, but uh, the efficiencies in digital currency are just, you can't, you, this is this is not going to go backwards. That's you know? right. That's right. And I'm an advisor for Ripple. I mean, one, some of the things that I think that it's interesting in that space is that, you know, they're talking to a lot of businesses about real problems businesses are facing, um, you know, moving money around and just trying to solve their operational problems. And so, one of the reasons that I think that you know this tech, this whole sector and the technology will grow is that the more you talk to businesses, the more you realize that they have many problems that are right. not well solved right. by the existing system. And the the uh, the idea of a blockchain and the idea of a secure ledger is incredibly powerful, and it can solve lots of different problems. So even if something happened to Bitcoin, we still expect that technology to be adapted and used right. in other ways. And I think before Bitcoin, these problems just seemed too big. You know, you're like, how are we going to fix the financial system? And people just dealt with it. Um, do you? How do you feel about altcoins? You know, like it's gone kind of crazy. I mean, you know, first Bitcoin and then Litecoin was kind of in there, and now Doge and Quark and you know, Ripple's a completely different thing. Do you? How do you see all this settling out? Do you think that? Uh, you know, in the next couple of years with all these altcoins? Well, so I, I think that the, the fact that despite the fact that there's massive development developer passion around mm -hmm. Bitcoin, the fact that some of those developers are also doing altcoins sort of says something about how these ecosystems bootstrap and actually how clever the mining idea mm -hmm. was in terms of bootstrapping because, you know, you, lots of, of entrepreneurs have great ideas for new kinds of platforms bringing people together and making markets and a lot of them don't ever get off the ground they don't grow you know eBay had their beanie baby but like you know right. how do you get started and the mining is just this brilliant way to get started because there's money right um, so the early adopters really make a lot of money now if you were an early seller on eBay you could also earn high margins right mm -hmm. so but you, you had to get the buyers and the sellers to come here you've got this community that's very aware of these possibilities and so if something starts to get traction they, they can you know they can mine and kind of earn free money and get a lot of excitement and then uh, they and then they become sort of both creators and participants as well as holders of the currency which then you know creates demand for exchanges to support it and so on and so I think some of the things that that illustrates is that um, both if your motivation is to be a great developer or if your motivation is to earn money um, working on a, a big platform is not always individually the right choice working on a new small platform, you can contribute more. You can affect its direction. You can have a bigger impact, make a name for yourself, and possibly make more money. So this is how small platforms can start to grow. Now, most of them will eventually fail. Mm -hmm. um, but it, the, another thing that, it, that their success so far, their sort of limited success illustrates is that how much, how flexible this ecosystem is. The fact that it's so easy for a, a virtual currency exchange to add another coin. 
Right. So you, you can draft off of all of the other types of, of institutions. Yeah, so yeah. if you're a new altcoin, um, people can bring their money in through businesses that were designed around Bitcoin. But then once you get your money into Bitcoin, you can very easily put it into an altcoin if you want to bet in those directions. So right now, I think most of this is sort of for fun and for, you know, for you know, particular purposes. Um, you know, each of them has some advantage, but it's not really clear that one of them is a real sort of challenger to Bitcoin. But I think what it shows to me more is the capacity of the ecosystem to, uh, to grow new coins if they need to. And so that to me gives me a lot more confidence in the whole thing. So let's say scenario A is there's no altcoins. Some, some, something catastrophic happens to the Bitcoin mm -hmm. protocol. We all want to get our money out. Right. So we all ping Bitstamp at once, withdraw, withdraw, <laughs> withdraw, withdraw, you know, probably like this thing right. freeze up, they break, they can't do the wire transfers fast enough. Like if everybody was trying to cash right. out at once, you know, even the best designed systems would, they pro I'm sure they planned for it, but it would put stress on right. the system. Um, if you, if you, on the other hand, now let's take the scenario where there's a couple of altcoins out there that are also on the Bitstamp exchange. So I can say, well, instead of, you know, shifting into dollars and trying to wire out, maybe I'll just shift into some other altcoins, or maybe there's another exchange that has less traffic, so I can move my bitcoins to that exchange and put them in an altcoin on that exchange. So I can sort of, in a more orderly manner. We could, we could sort of move off of Bitcoin without destroying right. large amounts of value and having sort of a catastrophe. Right. And not to mention the potential for a decentralized exchange that only trades in digital currencies. Uh, right. Which is, which is huge as well. Exactly. So these are, so I think these are kind of almost built-in um, safety valves, if you right. like. And they also, you know, and suppose that something happened more slowly. So suppose that somehow, you know, mining was getting more and more concentrated and people were more gradually getting concerned about that. Then we could sort of gradually, you know, shift some of our transactions and some of our store of value onto an altcoin, and that, 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 that would just sort of slowly put price pressure on Bitcoin, and it would all happen in a very orderly right. way. But what that means is that all of the venture capital investments and all of these startups are not dependent on a hole in the, the Bitcoin vertical. Yes, it could be catastrophic, and it could be that everybody just dumps and exits, sort of like, you know, dot-com, blah, 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 bursting, even good firms then couldn't get funding for a little while. But my, th my theory is it would be more likely, not not not... 100%, but more likely that we would shift in a, in a kind of more orderly manner because we have all, most of these, these investments are actually not specific to a particular protocol. I mean, they're partly, but, they, but you could change. Right, right. So to the best of my knowledge, this is the first time that we've seen a car chase based on an academic paper that someone wrote. Is this a common occurrence in uh, <laughs> academia? No, um, no. I mean, it's 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 relatively rare. I mean, you yeah. know, in the finance sector, right. you can attract a bunch of attention. So one of my students just wrote a paper, um, Eric Budish at Chicago, about high frequency trading, right. and I think he's got a bunch of high frequency traders with cannons aimed at, right, right. <laughs> aimed at his office. Um, but uh, I, I think he's I think he's physically safe. Maybe if you work on the economics of right. drugs or something, right. you get a little bit nervous. But right. This is a, you know, it's a very exciting area, and I think that it, it really, ca if you take the time to invest in it, and I think a lot of the kind of pundit economists haven't, mm -hmm. if you take the time to really think about the technology and the platform and the efficiencies it can drive, then you just get fascinated by it. It's so intellectually interesting. You know, and that's one thing that, that always occurred to me. You see these economists come out, and it seems like they don't understand it and they're dismissing it. Do you feel like any serious economist that looks at it deeply would appreciate it? I mean, to me, it seems like, how do you look at this? One, you can't, you can't deny it's a huge advancement for, for tech. You know, you think they, I mean. I think, I think, mo I think it's only slowly happening that people are really understanding yeah. it. Um, and, and I think it's easy to jump the conclusion you understand right. it when you haven't. One, uh, one comment I would have on that is, is that uh, you, if, if, you, if you think about this problem just as like, is it an attack on the dollar? Mm -hmm. Or like, you know, why, you know we, we already looked at private money and, right. and it doesn't work anymore. You know, there, there's, there, the, you know that, that was, it was a bad idea, it's inefficient. Right. So there's a, bunch of, there's a bunch of things that we think that we know, right. and maybe we do know them. Right. You know, and, and some of the early writings around Bitcoin um, were very, kind of taking kind of questionable economic theories or, you know, most mainstream economists aren't that worried about the dollar. Right. So if you start your conversation there, then you're going to run into resistance from mainstream economists. But I think if you start your, your conversation as, you know, 
PayPal made some traction in competing with the credit cards but didn't fully realize its potential. PayPal expanded the market, enabled new kinds of commerce to occur, it, it enabled entrepreneurship on a large scale, and it allowed people to do fundraisers and all sorts of things that they couldn't have done before and they just wouldn't have done. Right. Then, you know, you could say here's the next step in that evolution that has a lot of cost advantages that really kind of blow PayPal away in terms of sort of the some of the, the problems PayPal faced. And it, 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 its costs are so much lower, especially for small transactions, that you could really expand the market. That seems hard to argue with, like what right. economists would say that that's not an interesting thing to say, but I don't think they're thinking it from that perspective. One other um, reaction of economists is, is just based on ignorance of our current financial system. So I you know, had a group of economists who asked me, well, why does Bitcoin need to exist? Shouldn't our systems already be able to do this? And that, in some sense, is a deep mystery. Like, why? Right. You know, why do we use ACH the way it is? You know, why do wire transfers? Why do we still use checks? Do? It's 2014, why? and I can sign a piece of paper and give you twenty thousand dollars. But, but the answer, I think, you can delve. It's a longer conversation right. as to why. But the fact is that this is our current system is antiquated and inefficient. Right. There are reasons why it's hard to get a group of people to move, especially when the stakeholders are profiting from the current system. But usually what happens to get old antiquated systems to modernize when they don't really have the incentive to is competition. Right. Hello, Bitcoin. Meet the competition. Mm -hmm. if, you, if, if an economist says it should already be efficient, you've forgotten that there's a process by which right. the inefficient gets driven out by the efficient and meet the force that is going to make things the way a, a, a frictionless uh, a, you know, market economist would think they should be. So if this doesn't replace banking, you think it could actually really improve banking? When I lived in Chile, um, I could send free online transfers bank to bank instantly. And when I would tell them you couldn't do that in America, they were just blown away. You know, it's, it's another nightmare for me to just send money from my bank account to yours in the U.S. Well, send it from me to send it from my bank account to my bank account. <laughs> I, I, I paid a bunch of money to, to wire transfer fees this year when I was doing a remodel and I needed right. to get money. Contractor shows up and says, oh, I really need to get paid today. You know, and so mm -hmm. I need to move money from Fidelity to Bank of America or, you know, I'm paying right. a fee for that if I want to get it the same day. And so that, it is kind of amazing that it's that way. So I think, you know, competition is one way to get people off their butts and move to more efficient systems. So I think one of the long-term predictions would be that something, the, the banks don't necessarily move onto Bitcoin, but they develop their own more efficient systems and they, they, they also pass those cost savings on to consumers. Right. Not 100% because they still have market power. They won't, they will never price at cost. Um, but they'll price it something more reasonable. Yeah, cool. So what have you noticed that's really unique about Coin Summit compared to some of these other events? Well, so what, one of the things that's, that's just really interesting about this whole space is that you have the money and the investors and the old sort of buttoned up uh, ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And then the developers here, even relative to your standard sort of Silicon Valley developers, are you know, deep into security, they're probably right. the higher tech end of development and also have a wide range of motivations for what they're doing. And so the, the combination of those two communities around a common set of interests, where that, and that interest really spans sort of economics, business, um, and deep cryptography. That's, it's just incredibly intellectually stimulating. Like you really need to think hard about game theory and economics to understand what Satoshi did. Right. Um, and you need to think about economics and business and platforms to start a viable startup. But the set of people here is just incredibly high IQ mm -hmm. and uh, passionate and motivated and interdisciplinary in a way that's, I think, even in the internet space is, uh, is sort of at a polar extreme. Well, thank you, Susan. Thanks.